Grab your Bibles as we continue to look at our little series here on Keep Calm. Uh, as we've been looking at, it means to cast your cares on God because He cares for you. So let go of those things. Uh, ask God for help. Take Him to Him. Ask for His help. He is there on His throne, always ready, always willing to show His grace to us. And then leave it to God. Don't take it back. Uh, don't take it with you. Don't say, I'll ask for your help, and then now I'll take care of it from here. Uh, leave it to God. Uh, let God work, and then move on. And we're going to see today, as we come to today's lesson, a very good example of that. Uh, somebody who was able to do that through it all, in spite of disappointment and frustration. Anybody ever feel those? Yes. And it's come to my attention uh, that we get disappointed and we get frustrated because of a terrible thing called expectations. If we had no expectations, then we would never be disappointed. <laughs> but we do have our ideas about this and other thing. Now, I'll get back to that. Don't, don't leave this place saying the pastor said don't have any expectations. Have expectations, but not in the way you think. Because when we have our expectations, uh, we can often get frustrated. Uh, something as small as, I expected my keys to be where they were supposed to be this morning. And they weren't. I just got a hand signal that maybe we found them. All right, good. So, good. But it came with a good example for today. See, that's why it was there. So, no, it's, it's you expect them to be there and they're not. Nobody else can feel that, can you? <laughs> You have expectations that are not there. You get frustrated. You get disappointed. Uh, it goes to one of my, uh, a movie that always has a very dear spot in my heart is Princess Bride. Uh, one of the most quotable movies of all time. It's incredible. If you've never seen it, take a chance. Watch it. It's a little silly, but uh, it's a good little movie called Princess, The Princess Bride. And in it, it's a grandpa reading a story to his grandson uh, about the Princess Bride. And at one point, the grandfather reads that Buttercup, the heroine of the story, marries the evil, rotten Prince Humperdinck. Yes, it's that kind of story. You get names like Buttercup and Humperdinck. <laughs> and marries him. And the grandson just freaks out and says, Grandpa, you read that wrong. You read that wrong. She's supposed to marry Wesley. That's what's supposed to happen. Read it right. How many times do we do that with God? God, you read that wrong. <laughs> this was supposed to happen. They were supposed to do this. This was supposed to happen this way. That, God, read it right. <laughs> but was the grandfather reading it right? See, you've got to watch the movie now. See if he was or wasn't. So, and he was, and it all worked out. And that's the way it is with God. We don't have that same sight that God has, do we? We don't see how it all goes together. And as we look at the great promises of God, we start creating expectations that things should happen this way and things will happen that way and then he will do this and then I will do this and they will do that and this will happen this way and this will happen this way, and everything will be great then comes what? Disappointment and frustration because they don't happen the way we expected them to. How can we stay calm then? How can we get our heart to slow down, our mind to slow down and say, okay, this didn't happen the way I thought it was going to, but God is still in control and God will still keep his promises. We do that by staying what? Calm. <laughs> Take it to him, ask for his wisdom, leave it to God to handle it, and then what? Move on. Knowing that it's going to be okay. It may not be the way we expected, but it is the right way, isn't it? And we're going to look at the greatest example in the Bible of that, in my opinion, and that is a guy by the name of Joseph. Let's all grab our Bibles, and let's go to... Genesis chapter 37.
And when we look at the story of Joseph, and we're very familiar with it, when we look at this story, it's very easy to sit there and say, there's no way I could do that. You know, so there's some in the Bible, it's like, you know, I, I, could, do, I could have done that. I, I could be that way. I could be that faithful. I could have that kind of faith. I don't know about you, but when I look at Joseph, I go, I don't know about that one. <laughs> I don't know if I could have that kind of faith and that kind of faith. I don't know if I could keep that calm. But we're going to see how he does it. And we're going to look at the story, and we're going to start with what were the expectations. He was a young man born into a large family. He was the second to the last, the penultimate, <laughs> of uh, 12 sons. I'm sure there were some daughters in there as well. We know a few at least. So a huge family, uh, but he was the apple of his father's eye. His father, Jacob, was a very wealthy man, a very powerful man, uh, and had these sons. He was a wealthy landowner, lots of sheep and things like that. And he was born in this family, and he was the favorite son. In fact, let's start with chapter 37, verse 3. Now Israel, also known as Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. He even gave him an outward symbol so everybody knew that Joseph was his favorite one of all of his children. Now if you're in that position, what are you thinking? Life is good, <laughs> right? My father loves me above everybody else. I got this nifty coat. I've got my life is on an upward trajectory here, right? It got better. Not only did he have God's, I mean his father's love, but he had God's promise. What was God's promise? Very next verse. Verse 4, when his brethren saw their father loved him more than all the other brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Nobody likes that. And Joseph then what? Dreamed a dream. And he told his brothers, and they hated him yet the more. And he said to them, Here, I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, there were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood around about and made obeyance, bowed down to my sheaf. In other words, saying what? You all are going to bow down to me as your ruler. Did he have just one dream or did he have two? He even had a second dream. He was at the center and his brothers were stars and his mother and father also all bowed down to him. Again, what would be your expectations if you're Joseph right there? Expecting any problems? Expecting any issues? Hey, if his brothers actually do something, Dad will take care of them, right? <laughs> he was, he, my father will protect me and watch over me and take care of me all life, and then I know that someday I'm going to be a ruler of great power over my entire family, and they are all going to bow down to me. I have a wonderful life ahead of me. Now, your paper says, then life happened. <laughs> How many feel like that way sometimes? You have great expectation, things are going, and then life happens. Up here on the board, I decided to use a little explanation instead. Wham. You ever just went along, along you feel like somebody just slapped you across the head? <laughs> it's, like, it's just like, bam, things were going so smoothly. And then it's like, everybody's, everybody, see t everybody watch TV? It seems like every TV show now has at some point where a car is driving along, and you just know at any moment a car is going to come and T-bone that car. Wham! Out of nowhere. Because you know what they're talking about. It's a certain angle. You just know it's coming nowadays because everybody uses it. And that's what it feels like sometimes. We're driving along, having a nice conversation. Everything's going as we expected. And then what? Wham! And what was his wham moment? Well, Joseph was told to go check on his brothers. Genesis chapter 37, verse 18. And as he goes, and he had to track them down. Uh, they'd moved from their spot in Shechem there. And he tracked them down, and, and he's going to go and give a message from the Father. And here in verse 18, as he's approaching them, he says, And when they, his brothers, saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer comes. First of all, how'd they know it was him? 
the coat. <laughs> That's right. Little did the father know that when he was giving his uh, object of affection, he was also putting a target. <laughs> so I'd say, here he is, folks. And he was coming over, and their first response is, let's do what? Let's kill him. Now, fortunately, Reuben, the oldest son, said, that's a little extreme. <laughs> let's not actually get blood on our hands here and was going to try to get him away. But while Reuben was away, what did the other brothers figure out? Jump down to verse 26. And Judah said unto the brothers, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were like, cool. <laughs> Don't you love that from Judah? Let's not kill him. He is our flesh and blood. Let's just sell him. <laughs> Let's just get through this dream. Let's stop it. And that's the wham moon because some Ishmaelite Midianites came along and what did they do? They sold him into slavery, took his coat, ripped it up, threw some lamb's blood on there, took it back to father and said, oh, we found this and your favorite son is now dead. Happy Father's Day. Isn't that a great story for Father's Day? <laughs> it's a horrible story for Father's Day. But that's what happened. And all of a sudden, that wonderful life of love, of adoration, of great prominence was now what? Shattered. He's now being sold off into a foreign country. He never expects necessarily to see his family again. He has no expectation that he'd ever be a ruler of any kind or have a good life or anything. What would be your natural response to this wham moment? How many would get angry at God? Why did you leave me? Why did you abandon me? Why aren't you going to keep your promise? How many would get a little angry at the brothers? Oh, I hate those guys. <laughs> Why did they do this to me? This is unfair. This is no good. This, and get, just get so caught up in that moment and le lose all peace, lose all joy in life and say, woe is me and just curl up into a ball, right? But is that what Joseph did? No, he stayed what? Calm. Because he still had what? God's promise. Yeah, he may have had an expectation of how God was going to get that promise, <laughs> how he was going to get there. But at the end of the day, I'm not telling you to give up on expectations. But I'm saying, single, hone in your expectations on God's promises. Will he always keep his promises? Always expect that. And even when it doesn't happen like you expect it, <laughs> is God still going to do it? So what did Joseph do? What did that calm spirit allow him to do? Look at uh, chapter 39, verses 1 through 6. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him, of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master in the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in Potiphar's sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. So did he pout and throw a fit? Did he sit there and say, woe is me, this is terrible? Did he sit there and say, oh, God has abandoned me, I quit, I'm not going to do it anymore, why should I trust God? No, what did he say? I know that God is still with me, and I will serve whoever I am told to serve. I'm going to do whatever I'm supposed to do. I'm going to do it with joy. I'm going to do it with peace. I'm going to do it under the Lord. And who saw that? Potiphar saw that. He saw that the Lord was with him because of his attitude, because of what he did. He also saw that everything he did was upright, was good, 
and prospered in his hand because of God's blessing. And he basically put him in complete charge, even though he was, yes, a slave. He could just go anywhere, do anything, get any money, do anything he wanted to do. And God blessed him. Can we do that? When we have an expectation that God is going to do something a certain way, and it doesn't happen that way, and in this case it's because outside forces. There are people out there that will try to make your life miserable. Sometimes on purpose, sometimes on accident, right? Other people will do things that will seem to, dis to derail God's plan for your life. They will, they will do things that seem to get off track and get you going the wrong way from where God's blessing is. We have to step back and say what? Is God still in charge? Is God still blessed? Will God still get us where we need to be? And therefore be what? Be calm. <laughs> Give it to the Lord and move on, right? And that's what he did. And his life was wonderful from then on out. No, as your paper says, and then life happened. <laughs> Or as the board says, what? Wham! <laughs> and things were rolling along. Things were going well until this happened. Chapter 39, verses 7 and 8. And it came to pass after these things that his master, so Potiphar's wife, cast her eyes upon Joseph as she said, lie with me. But Joseph refused. And he said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house? And he hath committed all that he has to my hand. He's been good to me. I can take anything, but I can't take you. <laughs> that would be what? Wrong. Kind of like Daniel and his friends. They purposed in their mind and in their heart to do what was what? Right. And he's tempted, but he says what? No. But is that the end of that story? No, because she grabbed hold of him as he tried to get away, taking his jacket. And then when the other servants came, what did she say? He attacked me. And when Potiphar got home, what did he do? Verse 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. So now, he's falsely accused. How many would agree this was completely unfair? And I don't know why we have an expectation of fairness. <laughs> I don't know where we got that idea from, because is life always fair? Sometimes it is, and generally speaking it is, but there's also a lot of unfairness in this world, isn't there? People lie, people cheat, people do their things, right? And it's not fair. But is he going to let that get to him? Now he's in prison. <laughs> I mean, wh where is he supposed to be? He's supposed to be blessed, right? He's supposed to be the favorite son. He's supposed to be a life of leisure. He's supposed to be a ruler. And now he's down even further down than a slave. And he's in the king's, the pharaoh's prison down there. Now's the time to panic. Now's the time to say, God, why have you done this to me? Now's the time, right, to say, I give up and just be angry and bitter. Isn't this the time to do it? What did Joseph say? I'm staying calm. I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to trust that he is still in charge here and he knows what he's doing. And how did that exhibit itself? Chapter 39, verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed his mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. Basically, the keeper said, what? You're in charge. If they need something, go get it for them. If they have a problem, you take care of it. Uh, again, is he still a prisoner? Yes, but he has tremendous freedom because what did that keeper notice? The Lord is with him. Does our attitude make a difference in this world, Lord, <laughs> folks? Mm -hmm. And if we stay calm, especially in situations where everybody's like, you shouldn't. <laughs> you should be angry and bitter and hate everybody by this point, shouldn't you? 
But instead, what? He's trusting the Lord. And that shows. And he has tremendous freedom. And what? He didn't even realize what was going on. But was God at work? See, in chapter 40, all of a sudden, two other prisoners come in. One's the butler for Pharaoh, the wine taster. He comes in. The other one is the baker, the chief baker for Pharaoh. They've both done something wrong, which in those days didn't take much. <laughs> when you're Pharaoh, who can you put in prison? Anybody you want. Why? Any reason you want. So they were both ended up down there. And of course, who's going to take care of them? Joseph. <laughs> the keeper is like, you, know, you take care of them. And both of them happen to have a dream. Now, the butler, the wine taster, he had these bunches of grapes and then three of them. And then he says, what does that mean? What, what, what does it mean? What does this dream mean? And Joseph, let's take a look at it. Chapter 40. Jump down to verse 8. And they said unto them, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. Again, is he bitter at God? Does he hate God? He still trusts God. God is the interpreter of dreams. He's the one that gives us dreams. He's the one. How would he know that? Because he had a dream. <laughs> he had two dreams. Is he still trusting those dreams? Yes, after all of this, being sold by his brothers, a slave in Egypt, now a prisoner in the Pharaoh's jail, he still trusts the dream. Because God is the giver and interpreter of dreams, and he's still trusting God. No bitterness here. No loss of hope here. And they tell him the dreams, and he comes back and says what? Okay, you, Butler, this means in three days you're going to be restored to your position. The baker's like, yeah, I like this kind of interpretation. What does mine mean? He says, well, in three days you're going to be dead. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> what are you going to do, right? What happened, though? Did the butler in three days get restored? And what did Joseph ask him? Look at verse 14. Chapter 40, verse 14. But think on me when it shall be well with you, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. <laughs> did he want to be released? Yeah. And in three days, the butler leaves. And I always picture the last thing the butler saying to Joseph is, I'll remember you. <laughs> right? If all goes well and I'm restored, I'll remember you, Joseph. He gets out, Baker dies, and Joseph sits there. Any day now. What is he expecting? See, he sees the plan now, right? <laughs> He sees God's plan, right? The butler's going to go talk to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's going to bring him out because of this great injustice. Maybe he'll work for Pharaoh, and then Pharaoh will make him something, you know, some, something important because God's always with him, and his brothers will have to come. This is going to be great. A week goes by. A month goes by. A year goes by. 18 months go by. Two years go by. And when did the butler remember? None of that time. What was Joseph doing? Now let's face it. Talk about frustration and disappointment. This is the one that gets me. Waiting. <laughs> Wait. You expect somebody to be there. You expect somebody to do something. You expect something to happen. And it just what? Does. You know it's going to, but <laughs> why do I have to wait? Why, but, but does he lose hope? Does he become despondent and disappointed and depressed? No. He continues to work, continues to do his thing, and then finally, finally, <laughs> it comes down to it. Chapter 41. Chapter 41, verse 14. Because now the Pharaoh, two years later, 
Pharaoh has a dream. And what does the butler finally remember? Oh, yeah, I know the guy. <laughs> he interpreted my dream and the baker's dream, and they were both right. Why don't you call him? And Pharaoh does. For, verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of you that you can understand a dream to interpret. And Joseph answered Pharaoh and saying, it's about time. No. <laughs> he says what? It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. It's all part of God's plan. What if the butler had told him about him two years earlier? Wouldn't have been time. The situation wasn't ready. See, God's up there playing 18-dimensional chess, right? <laughs> He's moving all the parts. He needed Joseph where? In Egypt. He needed him in prison. He needed him to meet the butler. He needed that butler to wait two years to tell Pharaoh about it so he could have the dream, and then he could come out and do what? Interpret it. Seven cows, seven fat, seven skinnies, seven ears, seven, seven years of good, seven years of bad, store it up, and to do it all to not only save Egypt, but save the world. <laughs> God had a plan, didn't he? And just because it did not meet his expectations about what his life would be like and how God would accomplish his promises, he never gave up, did he? He continued to trust the Lord, and after one hit, after another, after another, he continued to say, I will trust the Lord. The Lord will do this. The Lord will see it through. And did God keep his promise? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, he was made what? Look at verse 39. Chapter 41, verse 39. And Pharaoh, after he interpreted the dream and told him all about what it meant and what they needed to do, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed you all this, there is none so discreet and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. Which is truly an amazing statement. I never really caught that before. But basically what the Pharaoh was saying is, if I'm walking down the street, you rule over me. <laughs> when I'm sitting in the throne, I'm over you. So even the Pharaoh was like, if the Pharaoh was like, well, I'm not going to uh, give up any of my food, or I'm not going to ration anything, who could come into his house and say, Pharaoh, put the spoon down. <laughs> That's enough Cheerios for you. All right? He was given that much authority. And then we know how the story ends, don't we? There was famine throughout the land, just as God said. After the seven years of plenty, there was famine. It hit, of course, Jacob and his family. They had to come where? To Egypt. And they had to bow down to whom? To Joseph. How could Joseph have such faith? Well, because his expectation was God would keep his promise, and that was it. He didn't have expectations about how he would do it or when he would do it. He just said, God will what? How many of us have promises from God? And will there be people around us who do things that try to derail those promises or try to get us to forget those promises? Will there be times when there is great injustice and unfairness that seems to take away those promises? Are there times when we have to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait? And it doesn't seem like it's ever going to happen. In those situations, we have to what? Trust the promise. And just expect that God will keep his promise. Then we can have calm, can't we? In fact, at the end of it all, after his father died and everything, let's go to uh, chapter 50 of Genesis. We read this before when it, we talked about letting go of anger and retribution and vengeance. Because when Jacob died in Egypt, all the brothers were like, oh, now we're going to get it. <laughs> now Joseph's going to come down hard on us. Now, now that dad's gone, 
We don't have that protection. But Joseph says this amazing thing that is true for us still today, isn't it? Chapter 50, verse 18. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face again, just as promised. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Again, it's not our job to take vengeance. It's not our job to judge, is it? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto what? Good. To bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. All the things we're going through, they may not meet our expectations, but they are exactly what God wants. It's exactly what God needs to happen. Why? I don't know. <laughs> we may not know to the end. We may not know until eternity. <laughs> Why? We, the timing and the issues and things that needed to come about because of these things. But we just have to what? Trust the Lord. As it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, what? All things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. All things work together for what? Good. So our only expectation should be what? Our, my expectation is that it's all good <laughs> and that God will keep his promise. That way we can keep calm, right? You say, how can I do that? Well, go to him. Say, Lord, uh, what you doing? <laughs> Why is this happening this way? This isn't what I expected. I trust your promises, but what's going on? I ask you for wisdom. Give me understanding. Give me peace. Give me joy to get through this. I'm going to leave it to you. Take care of this. And then do what? Just as Joseph did in every situation, he just what? Moved on. I said, I'm going to work with joy. I'm going to work with peace. I'm going to get good night's sleeps. <laughs> no matter where I'm at, no matter what I'm going to do, I'm going to, people are going to know that the Lord is with me. And what a testimony he was to so many people through this, wasn't he? Can we be that kind of testimony? Even when times of disappointment and frustration? Yes. Just give it to the Lord. 